Thank, thank you, Art, and welcome, everyone. Just really happy to see everyone uh, here today uh, for this fabulous conference. The medical technology innovation is able to take great leaps and bounds when the innovators are at the forefront of both the engineering sciences and the life sciences. Our plenary speaker this morning falls into this category and is one of the giants of biomedical engineering, so we're in for quite the ride. Emmett Toner is professor at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School and is professor of health sciences and technology in the Harvard MIT program in health sciences and technology. He's also the founder of the NIH Biomicroelectromechanical Systems Research Center and the director of the Biomedical Engineering Research and Education Program, both at MGH. So, pretty busy individual. He's an expert in intracellular ice formation, cryobiology, biopreservation, tissue engineering, and microfluidics, among many other areas. As early as 1994, he received the YC Fung Award, the top biomedical engineering award offered by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. He's a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biomedic Biological Engineering and was elected to the National Academy of Ventures, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine. So, not too shabby. But most importantly, in 2010, GQ magazine named Dr. Toner as one of the 17 rock stars of science. So, be jealous, everyone. He's authored hundreds of papers, has mentored more than 70 grad students and postdoc fellows, over 40 of whom now hold major academic positions, is a scientific founder of many startup companies. We're so pleased he's here with us today to bring us up to date on the fascinating world of precision microfluidics. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Toner. Thank you, Will, and uh, thank you, Art, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's not my first time. I've been at this meeting before, and uh, it's really a fun meeting. You learn about innovation, and it's the best uh, medical device uh, uh, community and the meetings. I'm really humbled and honored to be here. By the way, I didn't slap anybody. I, I, I had surgery two days ago, and I also I want to uh, echo what uh, what Art said. The fact that we can see each other's faces is wonderful. I'm actually attending two meetings at this hotel today, so I'll be in and out. So if anyone has any questions after my meeting, I'll be around uh, in and out. And uh, thanks again. So I, I can have the, if I can have the slide. Well, while we are trying to get that connected. Um, what I would like to do today is talk about microfluidics. And there's the name. Uh, oh, here we go. Perfect. Thank you, Will. And uh, so I want to talk about two things, microfluidics and large volumes. They're actually not, uh, it makes no sense uh, because large volumes, I will talk about liters of volumes. And I will talk about microfluidics, which is a technology to do precise movement of particles in fluids at very small amounts. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about innovation that uh, has gone into pushing the limits of microfluidics to large volumes. You can think of it as uh, uh, the field of microfluidics started with handheld computers, and we are trying to build the Cray computer equivalent of microfluidics. And, uh, and you, you do use the uh, techniques of microchip to make these devices, so actually the uh, analogy is not uh, uh, that off. Um, there are a number of applications. I'll uh, try to mention some of those applications, as well as the bioengineering, the innovation that uh, had to go into it to be able to process these kind of fluids. And uh, just very quickly, the field of microfluidics, which started in actually late 1970s, early 80s, and uh, it is, uh, the white size is a wonderful review article if you're interested. In, in 2006, uh, published in Nature. But the whole idea is to control uh, precisely fluids of uh, 10 to the minus 10 to the 10 to the minus 18 liters of fluid. So it's, we are talking about very tiny amounts single uh, cells, a single bacteria, a single red blood cell, or a single molecule with that sensitivity. 
And uh, the innovation that went into it is uh, come from integrated circuits, uh, MAMS, uh, microelectromechanical systems, microsensors, as well as uh, micro valves, and applications has been uh, in general in what we call chemical and biochemical areas, making very precise chemical measurements. In about early 2000s, we said, can we push this to the other extreme of large volumes? And, um, and if you look at some of these volumes, for, for example, when you have a finger prick of blood, that is about uh, half a billion cells. When you go to your physician's office, you give a one or two tubes of blood. One tube of blood is about 50 billion cells in it. So suddenly the numbers get pretty big. If you give blood, and uh, they take a pint of blood, which is almost uh, half a liter blood, that has about 3 trillion cells in it. And human body has about 37 trillion cells. So the numbers get pretty big. And uh, so what I'll show you is that early on we started in processing these kind of complex fluids, such as blood, at speeds of uh, maybe two to three million cells per second, and uh, maybe processing about a liter, uh, a milliliter of blood within an hour. And uh, today we can process uh, 300 million cells per second, and we can do a pint of blood within less than an hour. 300 million cells per second, that if you, you know, the we can find one person in the United States in less than a second. And so not only process, but also sort the cells within the, uh, uh, in the process. Um, market for microfluidics is growing rapidly. And uh, in 2018, it was in the range of about $5 billion, a big portion of it in the US. And it's expected over the next few years to grow to about the uh, uh, $22 billion, and a lot of this doesn't actually take into account the new innovation and the areas that I'm going to talk today. Uh, it is mostly the more advanced, uh, more uh, mature areas. Just to give you a sense, the diff diff uh, different uh, bodily fluids and uh, blood, oops, I guess it doesn't like that slide specifically. How about the next one? Okay, the next one. So that I'll, I'll just mention some of the bodily fluids. Uh, somehow it doesn't show the slide. So blood is one of them. And the applications for that are, I will uh, share with you, rare cells. There are some rare cells that control a lot of physiology, a lot of disease. Uh, there are applications in uh, cancer therapy, blood storage, and immunotherapy, CAR T cell uh, therapy. There is bone marrow, <laughs> more complex than blood. There are pieces of bone in it too. And uh, it's used in spine fusion, cancer therapy, organ transplantation. And uh, urine is very common, of course, infectious disease to cancer again. Cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, uh, is used for a number of applications, a infectious disease, as well as uh, a number of um, uh, uh, cancers, especially glioblastoma, bronchioalveolar lavage, peritoneal washing, ascites. Ascites could be five liters. And all these fluids range from 10 to five liters volume, and they're tremendous clinical applications. Many of you do not know this information. And don't feel bad if you don't, because I asked this question at the medical school. Most physicians don't either. As I mentioned, there are 37 trillion cells in our body. Almost all of them, 85% of them are blood cells. So we are actually a big ball of blood walking around. About 34 trillion blood cells circulating all the time, interrogating everything that's happening in your body. And if we could read that information much better, you can get far more information and better diagnosis and better therapeutics, better monitoring, screening, early detection. 
And so the reason why we are very interested in blood is because its potential is huge. Typically, it's the most prescribed test in uh, clinical medicine, blood test, but it's, very, uh, it's not sensitive. You get some positives, and then you need to go into a big machine uh, to make other more sensitive measurements. And so the idea here, can we actually get more information from these bodily fluids that could uh, help us better monitor and diagnose as well as uh, uh, treat patients? So our goal is to uh, process large volumes of bodily fluids, do it in a, pre in a very precise way, and we don't, these are living cells. So you can't touch them and force them and push them around too much. They react to it. They don't like it. So can we do this without changing their biology, changing their gene expression, without killing them so we can culture them and get information from their functional aspects as well? and do that at a single cell resolution. We started this journey in early 2000, and, uh, and we took the rare cells as a, a challenge, as a moonshot, so to speak, because if we, we felt if we could find rare cells that are one in a billion, one in a 10 billion cells in the blood, since blood is probably one of the most complex fluids we have in our body, if we could, we said if we could crack open that uh, uh, problem, we should be able to use these same technologies for many different applications. We started with prenatal diagnosis, fetal cells circulate in the blood, they cross the fetal maternal barrier, and uh, if you could find them, then you can diagnose uh, a number of these prenatal genetic diseases, I don't want to break that. And, um, uh, but there are many other dendritic cells, hematopoietic stem cells, progenitor cells, and the one that I want to focus today is cancer cells. Tumor cells circulate in human body, and I'm talking about solid cancers, not blood cancers. And in fact, nine out of ten deaths, except glioblastoma and few other uh, cancers. The cancer kills because it spreads. It's a process called metastasis, and the cells circulate in the blood, and, uh, and that's the mechanism. So imagine, imagine if you can uh, find these cells in circulation. And uh, the first evidence of this is, uh, was in 1849 uh, by Dr. Ashworth at the Monash University in Australia, post-mortem. In a patient, he showed that actually, in a, a male a cancer patient, he showed that the tumor cells circulate in the blood. And, uh, but it's been there so rare that it's been very difficult to find ways to uh, routinely isolate these cells. But if, if you could do that, especially today with immunotherapy becoming almost the norm, and uh, you can uh, monitor these uh, diseases much more closely, they are very toxic treatments. You can stop the treatment when it, uh, uh, the treatment stops. Many of these uh, develop resistance during treatment. After a year or two treatment, you can monitor and determine when the resistant uh, genes are expressed so you can uh, stop treatment. And uh, early detection is the holy grail. If we could find cells early and diagnose cancer early, Today's treatments actually could turn into a cure, but most of the 90% of the cancers we find late, and 99% of the funding, we put it into late uh, stage uh, treatment of cancer. And then there's the personalized oncology. If you can find these cells and culture them, treat again, uh, uh, test them again, screen them against uh, drugs, and find the drug that it kills the tumor cells from that specific patient. So the applications would be great. The first technology we developed in uh, 2007, we published this one, and um, it was uh, the, uh, Sunita Nagrat was the uh, postdoctoral fellow who is a faculty member now at the University of Michigan, and she really was behind the innovation. She was computational biology, a, a, a computational fluid mechanics person, never touched a pipette. She said, I want to learn about the laboratory work. And uh, so this was the project she took. She's crazy. I don't know why she did that, but she did a wonderful job. She really published the first large volume 
microfluidics. And uh, here the idea was if we take a tube of blood, uh, which is about 50 billion cells, push it through a microchip, the chip has these posts. The posts are about 50 micron in diameter, you can see them there. And there are about 100,000 of them. We calculated, of course, she calculated the fluid mechanics of the flow and uh, to make sure the posts are distributed such that as blood, whole blood flows through, the posts are coated with an antibody that recognizes tumor cells, but not the uh, blood cells. So the blood cells go through to tr uh, waste and tumor cells stick to that surface. And on the right, you see uh, from an early uh, experiment we did with a real cancer patient, in this case, prostate cancer patient. You see the posts uh, uh, and the cells stuck to those posts. Those are tumor cells. The green is a tumor marker. And the red, actually, uh, blue is a marker that uh, stains the nucleus of the cell. And the red is a marker that tells us whether or not the tumor cells is actually dividing in the blood. It's a marker that stains chi 67, which shows that the cell is actually replicating DNA in, in a proliferative state. So you can imagine, you get the cell, you can see it, but you can also get molecular information from it. One of the early applications uh, we looked into was uh, um, at the time, in 2004, the first targeted treatment for lung cancer uh, uh, was developed at Mass General Hospital, actually, by Dan Haber. And uh, there's a drug called Gepitinib. If uh, the patient has EGFR mutation, you give that drug, it wipes out the cancer for two, three years, and then it bounces back because there's a resistance gene uh, that's expressed over time, and the cancer comes back. So we looked at it, we said, can we find these cells, sequence it, and then find the mutation, then you give the right treatment to the right patient, and then also monitor it to see whether the resistance gene is expressed uh, over time, that's uh, T790M. And um, so you can see that figure on the right top, and uh, the y-axis is number of circulating tumor cells over months. You see that the patient response has the EGFR mutation, it's put on the gefitinib, responds beautifully over, I believe, nine or 10 uh, months over there. And then you can see that the circulating tumor cell numbers start coming up again, and that's when the uh, resistance gene is expressed. So we can monitor the gene, uh, give the right drug, and then stop and change the treatment. Uh, the bottom panel there also shows that once you have the resistance gene, the survival is much less. So you need to change to a different treatment. So you can monitor these patients much more closely. There are not different ways to do this. You don't need the uh, cells, but this was an early example that from a clinical setting how we could get this information. We also pushed the innovation and uh, to uh, be able to, these are rare cells. We know we are not perfect in uh, capturing all the tumor cells. So we want to improve the technology. So we made these posts from vertically aligned in nanotubes. So it's porous, the cells can't go in, but the fluid can. So we are playing with the boundary layer to bring the cells closer to the surface. Or we make the surfaces that has nanopores at the bottom, again, playing with boundary layer to pu pull the cells towards the surface. Or herringbone type structure on the top surface that creates advection convection flow to bump the cells up and down, and the surfaces are coated with an antibody to stick to the cancer cells. And we have also engineered surfaces where we can have cross links to the surface that we can uh, uh, release it, reverse it, so we can release the cells from that surface. And, um, and so we learned in this process quite a bit, and many others started uh, using similar technologies to isolate these cells in Use, oops, we have certain slides. Okay, let's see if we have more surprises. And uh, so that was uh, a slide that showed the other types of technologies, microfluidic, that will isolate what we call positive selection. So I have an antibody that recognizes the tumor cell, 
typically we use epithelial cell adhesion molecule because almost all uh, solid tumors occur in the epithelial cell of the organs. And EPCAM, epithelial cell adhesion molecule, is a common one. But these cells change their phenotype. So after five or so years later, we had uh, some unpleasant learnings. Some of these unpleasant learnings that they actually go through what's called epithelial mesenchymal trans transition, EMT. So they shed their EPCAM. You can't find them. Or they are covered with platelet. It's a stealth cell. You can't find it. Uh, many of them are dual positive. Some of them are in clusters. Some of them are dividing. So we realized that for each cancer and stage of the cancer, we needed to optimize the capture moieties. And that became complicated. And so we started asking, at the same time, I will, for a few slides, I will uh, change slide direction and, and we'll come back to uh, circulating tumor cells and how we got around this positive selection. And um, with Dino uh, Di Carlo, who's now a faculty at uh, UCLA, and we got into, this, stumbled into this uh, phenomenon called the inertial focusing. When you're in a laminar flow, particles follow streamlines. They, they're not supposed to change streamlines. It happens if the particle is in the same order of magnitude as the channel, the shear gradient is such that it pushes the particle towards the wall because the particle now can sense different shear stress on uh, force on two sides of the particle. It's pushed towards the wall. And when you get to the, towards the wall, of course, you have flow around it and uh, vortices. The wall pushes you back into the flow. So you find these equilibrium positions. Now look at this movie. Hopefully it plays. I'm increasing the flow rate. You can see particles come, and as in laminar flow, wherever streamline they are, they come out at that streamline. But as you increase the flow rate, you start seeing that they're actually in two locations. And they keep increasing, and they're equidistant from each other, too, with empty spaces in between. And that's because of the forces and math. And I won't go into details of it, but this is, we call this inertial focusing. It was actually observed way back in what's called tubular pinch in 1960s in large pipes, sewage systems and other large pipes. The particles actually concentrate at the periphery. And um, if you bring the Dean force into it, put a curvature, you, instead of two, you could have a single line. And you see at the bottom video, that the, that's at the inlet, particles come at random locations at the inlet. And look at the one on the right exit, they are a single file. You can, it's extremely high throughput. Reynolds number is between 10 and 100, and the particle Reynolds number. And you can, uh, you can see the longitudinal ordering. You can see multiplexing, and you can fractionate particles. So it's, of course, unlike like a big tube, it's micro scale. You can play with these particles in ways you can't possibly do otherwise. And this phenomenon became actually quite exciting, and many people are working on it for many different applications. And it's been a great innovation to actually move particles on, uh, on chips, so to speak, and uh, different uh, uh, shapes, spirals, and trapezoidal, pinch flows, vortex flows and siphoning, deformation, as well as three-dimensional structures to create inertial focusing devices to move bodily fluids around to do bacterial sorting and other type of applications. But I want to come back to, with this little uh, deviation, uh, come back and show you how we want to use this in uh, circulating tumor cells. That's Dan Haber, my partner in crime. We, uh, early on, we actually merged our labs. We don't collaborate. We work together. That's part of the important innovation. These pro the reason, typically, when you develop a medical device, you know what use you have for that device, and you know about the clinical utility. Here, 
We don't know the biology of these cells. We don't have the technology, and we don't have any idea about the clinical use. We need to develop the clinical uh, as a use uh, for this. And so three moving parts, we realized that this is not a collaboration where we could provide different. So we actually merged our laboratories uh, to be able to tackle the flavor of the problem we need to face and solve at the, uh, that day. So that sometimes it's technology, sometimes it's clinical, sometimes it's biology, sometimes it's molecular. And, um, and Ravi Kapoor joined us. Uh, he's uh, an in, uh, works in, in industry, but full time joined us uh, to lead an innovation team within our uh, research laboratories to scale up things. I'll show you some of the work he's done. And Shamala is an expert in molecular biology who took care of those aspects. The reason why I have a haystack and a needle there, before we were looking for the needle in a haystack with positive selection. Now we want to flip this around. We want to get rid of the haystack, haystack being blood cells. Your blood cells, my blood cells are identical. We have great reagents for that. Tumor cells, even in a, in a patient, changes during the treatment and between people it's different too. So going after the tumor cells wasn't the right thing we felt. And we said, why don't we get rid of the uh, haystack to find the tumor cells? Well, the problem is if you have two tubes of blood, I already told you, that's 100 billion cells. To find one cell in two tubes of blood, by the way, today we can find one cell in four tubes of blood. I can spike one cell into a formula of blood and find it. So that's one cell in 200 billion cells. In two tubes of blood, which is typical blood draw in a patient, you have to get rid of uh, 99 billion, 900, 99 million, 900, 999 cells to find that darn cell. So you, have to be, you better do it perfect. And um, so we designed this concept, and this was actually on a flight with Dan Haber coming from uh, uh, LA, it said uh, GQ magazine shoot out actually, and it is true. And uh, GQ magazine had uh, um, uh, a rock stars of uh, science, so they paired us with uh, a rock star. And they had a, uh, we had to go to Hollywood for a shoot out, and uh, I was paired with uh, this guy called uh, BMB. I don't know. At, at the time, he was famous. He's not, he thinks the world is flat and he's not famous anymore. But <laughs> at the time, I had no idea. And uh, the nicest guy, though. We had, we had a blast. And uh, so, the way on the way, uh, we, I was trying to figure out how we can use this inertial focus. If those particles I showed you, cells, are white blood cells, Imagine I can put a magnetic bead on it, because I know the antigens on the surface. I can bind to the white blood cells, unlike, unlike tumor cells. Then bring it to a magnetic area, I can deflect them. Because inertial focusing, each particle is independent of each other. I showed you it's longitudinally, it's equidistance. So I made my billions of particles independent of each other. Red blood cells and platelet, well, we could do a microfilter. Microfluidics does that very well because they are smaller. So I can get rid of them, initial part, in a, a technology that uh, Bob Austin at Princeton invented called deterministic lateral displacement. It's the Japanese pachinko game. You drop the coin in the pachinko game, the small coins go down, big coins, ping, 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 go this way. It's exactly the same principle. Now we use a different principle, but initially we used DLD, deterministic lateral displacement, to get rid of platelets and red blood cells first. Before we do that, we label the whole blood with the magnetic beads, micron-sized magnetic beads that have antibodies on their surface that bind to white blood cells, leukocytes. So white blood uh, tumor cells are not labeled. And then we go to inertial focusing area in the middle. We make them into a single file. I got rid of red blood cells and platelet and come to the magnetophoresis region, deflect all those tens of millions of white blood cells, and you collect the uh, tumor cells, pressed in, untouched, 
and the flow, uh, you see the device there, we build it in two parts because the DLD device has size features that you, we couldn't do at the time in plastic. So we use deep reactive ion etching. That's, you see the one that's closer on the right, the, that's in a plastic, that's uh, made in uh, silicone with deep reactive ion etching. It has about 2 million of these micro pores that are about 10 micro, 256 parallel units that does uh, get rid of the red blood cells and platelets. And um, the thing is that in a metal in the middle is the magnetic portion. Those are the magnets, the house, the housing for the magnets. And so we optimize the engineering of this in two pieces and connect it with the tube. And uh, on the right, you see the Pachinko device. You see four or five of these 256 parallel units, lots of little posts. Uh, when you look at the red uh, dye that comes on the, uh, right next to the images, that's red blood cell platelet and labeled in red and white blood cells labeled in green dye. So those are strict images. As the actual blood going through the chip, we take images, you see that green cells, white blood cells are separated. That's the pachinko. The big coins are separated. And uh, then you go to inertial focusing. The only important part of that device is that loop on top that has the inertial focusing. I think we have 20 plus issued patent on that. And uh, so you see that the colorful thing coming in, cells are all throughout the channel. After one turn, you see it's a single line. Everything's lined up there on the top. And then it comes to the magnetic region, you see two colors separate. Basically, we get move the white blood cells away from the tumor cells. And that's the principle. I won't go into much of the detail, but there's a lot of a trick to the magnetic circuit that required a lot of innovation. It wasn't straightforward and uh, because some cells have more beads on them, white blood cells, some less. You can clog these channels. So we do in two stages. Stage one is a low magnetic uh, field and we remove the cells with lots of beads. It's like a Formula One race that you go through the thing once more, inertially focus, come back again, and then we can, we can move a cell with a single bead on it in this. So if I have a white blood cell with one bead, one micron bead, I, I have enough magnetic moment to move that, to separate. Then we went to a single chip, monolithic plastic. We got very good and we now can innovate uh, and uh, do uh, plastic manufacturing uh, at those dimensions. And we worked with uh, Sony DAC. Sony at the time was hurting because Blu-ray technology was uh, not selling much anymore. So they were looking for applications of their technology. So we really pushed the limits of the plastic manufacturing with them. And Sony was afterwards bought by Stratec, is a company in uh, Australia now, in Germany. We worked with Stratec now. So this chip doesn't play music. It could if you wanted to. But it's the CD technology. We just didn't want to change the form factor because it will be too costly and risky. And uh, it's parallel two units. Blood comes from the top in the middle. There's two squares you see. That's the pachinko game, separating red blood cells and platelet, inertial focusing ch channel, and then twice the magnetic sorting race. And then there are holes, uh, resistances to match. So it's a monolithic chip, blood comes in, labeled white blood cells labeled with beads, very standard technology, and tumor cells come out. Just to give, and, and uh, Stratec and Sony scale this up. The chip is $20 or so now. So it's manufactured in volume. The black in the middle is holding the lines in and out. And on the left, on your right, I'm sorry, is a processor that catapult. We work with, uh, we build it first and then outsource it to a company to make it in an automated way. So our technicians now can learn this in a day. And we do three to 5,000 samples a year. And uh, the cell, the sorting speed here is about 30 million cells per second. And we can find, as I told you, one cell in 40 mil. And the cells spend one millisecond in the device. So it's in a tube. 
one millisecond, it, it, it comes out of the device. So they are pressed in, they are alive. Just to give you some sense of the biological application, this is from four different cancers, melanoma, lung, prostate, and breast cancers, real patients, real samples. You see on the left the images, Green is EPCAM. You see that there are different intensities. That means they have different amounts of EPCAM, some very little, some a lot. The size varies. And you can see it on the histograms on the right, that for the, these different cancers, the size and EPCAM is variable, but we can still find it because we are agnostic. We don't need to know anything about the tumor. It could be any solid tumor. We can't find the tumors now because we get rid of the haystack. Oops. Okay, this was going to show, and, uh, okay, this is one of the clinical applications. We wanted to know what is the difference of the circulating tumor cells from other uh, primary tumor as well as blood cells. So uh, David Ting and, uh, uh, did a study using um, uh, the sequencing without amplifying and show that there is a signaling molecule called WIND that's overexpressed in most of the uh, circulating tumor cells. It's very critical because now you have a target for therapeutics, but you also can uh, figure out whether or not a person has a cancer that is more aggressive if it has this biomarker. But you won't, you can see that slide. Oops, you can see. Oh. This is good. This is immunotherapy. This is melanoma. There are no markers for melanoma. If you wanted to find these cells, you couldn't find with positive selection. We can find it. And we, uh, we used about 19 different markers, gene markers, transcripts. And then we can create a circulating tumor cell score. And we can do this because it's a blood test. You can do it weekly. So we can actually calculate the delta T. How does, within a given patient, number of tumor cells that have these markers change? If you didn't do delta, you don't see a difference between those that express these genes more versus less. They don't separate as well in the middle figure. If you look at the right figure, suddenly they separate. So that's good engineering. You can't do that in clinical medicine easily. But if you have an essay that's a simple non-invasive essay, you could do it. And then suddenly it separates. So these patients are on immune checkpoint therapy, very toxic, and you know which ones are not responding very quickly. So it's very important application. We can culture them. So you can actually screen for drugs, drug sensitivity study. You can give the right drug to the right patient at the right dose. And our culture efficiency is terrible. In this study in 2014, I believe, it was 6 out of 36, so about 5% or so. We have uh, 6 cell lines from this uh, study, but now we have maybe 30 cell lines. After the 6 years or so working on this, our efficiency is about 5%. Clinically, I'll talk to you a little bit how we can get this higher. But the important thing here, this patient, breast cancer, does not have the breast anymore. So you don't have the primary. You cannot know the initial molecular markers are irrelevant. Now you're bombarding the patient with chemotherapy, the uh, cancer changes. So we actually find, when we sequence the uh, cells that we find in blood, there are de novo mutations, mutations that emerge during treatment. And for example, in one of those patients, uh, there are three of them. They, these are druggable mutations. We have uh, inhibitors for these mutations. You just wouldn't know otherwise. So we actually treated this patient's cells in an animal model with a cocktail, which we never use for cancer patients. But here, because we know that there are new mutations in these patients that for which we have drugs, and you could wipe out the cancer in the animal model, mouse model. So you can see why if we could make this 70-80% of the patients, we find these cells and we can culture them. Now you can suddenly have a clinical way of uh, tackling uh, uh, individual precision oncology, individual patients. Uh, early detection, like I said, we find most of our cells very late. And, uh, and the idea here is can we detect early with this technology that's very sensitive? 
This is liver. I won't go into too much. Liver cancer, very early stage. We, we looked at seven genes. Each gene has uh, 10 to 100 transcripts, seven genes. Uh, you could have lots of hundreds of transcripts. And we use digital PCR to see if they have these little green droplets. You look, put them into millions of droplets, and if you have the transcript, you amplify, it turns green. We can detect one cell in 40 mil blood when we spike it. So when we looked into this, together with the common uh, AFP, alpha fetoprotein, which is the common assay used for uh, liver cancer, and the CTC score, we could suddenly, uh, with AFP, you can find 1 out of 15. With AFP plus CTC, we can find 10 out of 15 patients. So that's a remarkable uh, sensitivity. To finish this, uh, we have early detection. We are not good culture. We are not good. We show the clinical utility, but we have two types of blood. The person has uh, five liter blood, that's uh, about 20 mil. It's about 0.4% of the total blood volume. Dealing with a rare cell, we find one to five cells in two types of blood. It's very useful for advanced cancer, very useful monitoring, very useful for getting molecular information. But when you push it to culture, many of the cells are dying. You can't culture it. You don't have enough cells. And uh, for early detection, you don't have enough cells when you are in early detection. So many of the time, you're empty-handed. So the question is, can we interrogate the entire 5 liter? And how do we do that? Well, there's a process called lookup phrases. It's a common procedure. It's done in blood banking, transfusion, platelet transfusion, when you give blood. They take the blood from one arm, put it through a, a, a centrifugation system that separates uh, red blood cells, platelets, uh, from the white blood cells, where the tumor cells, and then you give the rest back to the patient. It's about a half an hour to an hour, depending on how much you want to push it. You can interrogate different amounts of volume, one to five liter, and it's a standard procedure. It also gives the neutrophils back because they are not uh, at the same uh, density, and neutrophils are very important for cancer patients. You don't want to take their neutrophils because they become neutropenic. And uh, so we have now this new bag, which is interrogating the entire 5 liter. It's called Lycopac. Well, it could be 6 to 120 mil. That's a lot of blood. It has some red blood cells in it. And that's 50-fold more than a tube of blood. That's a lot of, because we are some little, but it's from, coming from 5 liters of blood, not 20 mil and lots of white blood cells, and you need to get from 120 liters to a few milliliters of blood with all your tumor cells in it. So there, we needed to move faster, uh, um, uh, uh, much faster than we are going now, and uh, because of the uh, throughput. So we needed to get the magnetic uh, field much better. So instead of... Uh, I don't have much time, I won't go into details of it, but Avanish Misha, who was a postdoc at the time, now a faculty member with us in the center, uh, came up with this brilliant idea to bring the field, put, uh, uh, make channels right next to the flow channel, fill it with soft iron particles, and then the magnet from outside creates a magnetic field, uh, amplifies that, and uh, this way we can get a very high magnetic field within the channel, so that we can actually almost 100 times more uh, higher than the, the one I showed you before. And um, so I'll actually, it, it, it's microfluidics. Uh, there are lots of these lines. You can't see much. And uh, it looks nice. But that's actually on the right is an actual photograph of the chip by a, a very famous uh, photographer, Phyllis Frankel. And the one on the left is the chip itself uh, filled with a dye. Uh, we made this with soft lithography in our laboratories. Uh, we are an NIH resource center for this. And when it gets to a point where we are comfortable, can we navigate to plastic uh, with Stratec? So we are at that stage now. Uh, but this chip now interrogates and can sort cells at 300 million cells per second. 
I can inter, uh, sort 300 million cells and uh, isolate the tumor cells. And um, we tested it for a number of uh, different important metrics. For example, we can process 60, uh, 70 mil within an hour. Red blood cell volume is by six orders of my log reduced. White blood cells, uh, four logs reduced. Platelets, five logs reduced. These are very impressive numbers. We spike five cells into 120 mil. We find pretty much every one of them. And, uh, and then the cells are alive at the bottom. They culture, they grow, and they genetically, their expression level of the genes are not changed. So we characterize it because of pandemic. We haven't done patients, like we have three, four patients so far. We find thousands of these cells now, not few. And um, with that, why don't I stop? Because I think I um, took more than I expected. And uh, we jumped, oops. That's my acknowledgement slide. Okay, well, well, first of all, thank you to our patients because this is more than 10,000 patient blood that we have uh, given to us by our patients. So uh, it's very important that they acknowledge their commitment to our research. And uh, I did mention the people's name that I showed their actual work today. So I don't, I think I didn't forget anybody's name. And uh, so I'm thankful to uh, my collaborators. It's funded by NIH, uh, a number of foundations. Uh, the entire innovation of the plastic chip was funded by Johnson & Johnson when they were in diagnostics business. And then they walked out of the diagnostic business and that was a big bummer for us. And uh, we are just coming back uh, from that uh, thing. It's, those are the perils of innovation or real life applications. Uh, they just sell, sold their diagnostic entirely, and that was a big hit. We had a group of 10 people in innovation, led by Ravi Kapoor, within our academic center. We hired them with the salaries and the conditions of industry, because in academia, we don't pay you much. We pay you about one third of what real people pay you, and, uh, and we make you work twice harder. And nobody's going to come to us anymore. <laughs> but you have fun. So actually, we created this innovation team within that. And it was very transparent. It was no Chinese wall between those guys and the postdocs and graduate students. They worked together. Their job was not to publish papers. Their job was to make things work. And the academic team's job was uh, to understand how things work. And uh, that was wonderful because they really, we had an incredibly productive five, six years. And, uh, and um, so that, that's how we uh, created the ecosystem to be able to go from an idea on a plane ride from LA in five years to 10,000 patients uh, uh, tested. And, uh, and then went to even a new chip that can process 300. Actually, the current chip we have, we are in one trillion cells per are. So we even, we have a chip that's uh, an order of magnitude better than what I just showed you. Uh, so we are not going to stop. We're going to make it an apparatus device ultimately so you can get connected to this chip and only take the cells you need. You don't need to take all the white blood cells and then give it back to the patients. So that's where we are going. Thank you for your attention and thank you for the invitation. We have a few more minutes. To, yeah. if so, I, thank you. That was fascinating. We have time for questions. We have uh, mic runners. While we're waiting for the first question, I'm going to ask the first question. Uh, absolutely fascinating. And love how um, this, the fundamentals of fluid mechanics is, is driving a lot of this. Yep. Uh, to get to large volumes, you have two choices. One is you can push the, because you have small channels, right? One is you can push the velocity. And then the other is you can, you can parallel process. Right, so, yep. so multiple layers of chips, and it, it seems like the, the direction is pushing the velocity. We, we, well, we did both because uh, uh, the Pachinka device has 256 parallel units also. So, and uh, if the blood comes from a larger port at the beginning, and then we split it into multiple uh, smaller units. So we do both, otherwise you won't be able to get there. Yeah. 
even for the um, and other yeah. parts of it, of the, the channel? Uh, no. So is, there any, is there any issue with the velocity yeah. limit, yeah. just, you know, getting yeah. the blood through? Right, the but the, right after the pachinko, 90% of the blood goes to trash. So my total volume now reduced, yeah. so my flow requirements uh, are uh, about 10 times less. Okay. So uh, the multiplexing can be much less at that mm -hmm. point. So. Hi there. Um, I was wondering, how long do the chips last? Like, is there ever a point where they kind of stop working, and how do you detect that? Yeah. We, so like I said, we have thousands of patients a year. And it takes about a half a day to teach a, a technician who's skilled in laboratory uh, techniques uh, to do this. We honestly see very little failure. Maybe one in hundred, some clogging happens. And uh, usually either the chip fails, because we do inspect a portion of the chip statistically to make sure that batch of chips are, uh, are good. And, uh, but you know, that is not 100%, so sometimes they're missing poles and uh, clogging things. But it really, one in 100 or so, it's, it's really very reliable. And the chip last, uh, we use it for the, the last technology I showed uh, for over an hour now. And sometimes we use it twice, but if you want to make money, you don't use it twice. <laughs> uh, well, if you touch blood, I'm kidding, but if you touch blood, you have to discard it. But well, that was my question. As this goes to clinical practice, are they reusable, yeah. single use? How do you scale up? Single use. The chips are about twenty, thirty dollars, and uh, currently, with the economy of scaling, it will come down more. The beads are more expensive, actually, and the total cost of the assay to sort the cells. I'm not talking about the molecular assays because those are different depending on which assays you use. It's about one hundred fifty, two hundred dollars, which is very reasonable within what the, the reimbursements will pay for. You, uh, you, sp you spoke about uh, using this technology to detect new tumors. Uh, is this the same technology that's being used to determine if a tumor is gone? And the example is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, where they push down the, you know, the number of cells per you know, billion or something. So is this what's being used uh, to say you don't need treatment anymore because you're cured? Or in remission? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. We haven't used the chip in blood cancers, and uh, uh, mainly because uh, there are many tumor cells in blood uh, cancers, leukemia, to uh, lymphoma, so you don't need this sophisticated technology for that. However, uh, for after treatment to see whether or not it's coming back when the t numbers of uh, tumor cells uh, are low, it could be used. And we had done some work with myeloma, and but we haven't explored it uh, extensively. But it could certainly be used. And we are work, uh, talking to Dana Farber, and they have interest in exactly what you just mentioned. But it's, we haven't clinically validated yet. Hi, first of all, awesome talk, super exciting. Um, my question might be a little silly. Uh, how many times have you used this on people who didn't have cancer? And do you see the same kind of cells in those patients? Yeah. So false positives, basically. It, it, it's not a silly question, it's a very important question. So the question is, uh, do you see these cells in uh, normal people? And we do call our students and postdocs uh, normal, healthy volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> so we have looked at them, uh, at them significantly. So occasionally you might have a signal, uh, but n nothing that is very easy to differentiate. With, uh, you have to have a cutoff. But more importantly, a question, we actually, and it took us three years to do this study that you really want, which is you want to do the study not with healthy volunteers, young people, but people who are admitted to hospital for reasons other than cancer, colitis or other infections, whatnot. That study was not an easy one to get approved by IRB. 
And uh, because what do you do if you get something that's not you don't want to share with the patient? And how do you share it? Because this is clinical study. We have no right to share the information. So, but in the end, we were able to do that study. I believe we did 200 patients uh, free of cancer. So it, yeah, you do see very occasionally cells, but the, in cancer patients, the uh, signal is much higher. But that's a very good question, actually. It took us three, four years to get to that point. So my question is about manufacturing. Um, I have some ideas, but uh, how are these cells manufactured? And are you going to bring back the laser disc for larger diameter? I'm joking about that. By the way. But you mean how is the, the plastic chip manufactured? It's done by uh, the Blu-ray. It's injection molding, and uh, and we are open to other ways of manufacturing. And uh, we'll probably, in the new version, we'll probably won't use the CD disk format because now the Stratec has other formats. Over the time we've worked with them, last 10 years. And uh, um, we are comfortable and very familiar with that uh, technology. But if there are other ways to make it more efficiently, we are always open to it. Guys, does it sound like uh, um, using... Uh, other chips or technology like silicon chips, multi-channel system in case when, to, when one the channel is clogging to use other, other level of uh, ports in case? Yeah, so you are saying if, if the redundancy in the system, if one channel is blocked and right. then the flow, there is some, and uh, so we have 256 uh, uh, pachinko devices, so to speak, at the beginning, and there are four uh, Formula One race channels, and uh, so two on each side, four of them. So if one is not working well, the flow is deflected to the other channels, and there's enough. Uh, the sweet spot is actually quite good, so you can have twice or significantly more flow in one of those channels. And if all four clogged uh, for inertial focusing, occasionally we have large clogging, one in a hundred, then the chip fails. But the it's a non-invasive thing. You could get two more bloods of blood, and also it could clot before you use the whole blood, and then you put a new chip and continue the experiment. Thank you very much. There are a lot of, uh, of course, things I didn't mention, like how you shake the blood, what temperature you keep the blood, how do you label the blood. We have a rocking system. Uh, that uh, actually very, it took us over a year to figure out those conditions. They are simple conditions. We published them all, but you need to know how to handle blood to be able to do it. Hi, Neil and I with Medtronic here. Just in, yeah, absolutely incredible work and, and, a, and a great presentation there. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about your vision for the future, say 10 years from now. Do you see the, the science and technology being applied in, in, in other areas, other therapies? Um, okay. What's, what's your, your dream? Right. I'll answer it in two parts. Uh, my dream, I, I'm more interested in pushing the technologies to the limits for cells. My particle is cells. So there are applications in stem cells. Certainly, we are exploring CAR T cell applications as the field goes to uh, subpopulation of T cells, T helper cells, nature killer cells, so on and so forth. We want to be isolate those cells and stem cells for a number of regenerative medicine. As you know, the cell and gene therapy field exploding. That's one of the biggest innovations right now in medicine. And uh, so when you say cell and gene therapy, you're basically taking organs and tissues and isolating cells uh, or blood. And so we are very interested in all aspects of cell and gene therapy manufacturing and uh, how we can uh, bring innovation and modify these chips for specific applications. And uh, so the utility is uh, beyond cancer also. And, uh, on the cancer side, there are three important particles circulating tumor cells, exosomes. These are particles uh, of, uh, that the cells spit out, so to speak. It's a biological process, but it has a lot of uh, RNA, protein, DNA, even DNA in them. 
So you have some of those biomarkers, and then cell-free DNA. And uh, all these particles are unique particles that uh, over the last 20 years became, we became familiar with them. So it is very important that they will all work together. For different applications, you will use one, two, or together. Uh, it doesn't matter. The good news is that we have incredibly powerful particles that we can now isolate and use them as a way to better diagnose, better monitor uh, cancer patients. So we are also looking into that aspect. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering what the uh, magnetic microbes are made of, and can you reuse them at any point? <laughs> no, you can't. Unfortunately, you can't use them. That's the most expensive part. And uh, 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 there are different ones uh, uh, from uh, uh, dynal beads, and there are gold ones, uh, iron ones. So they're different. Uh, the ones that we use are the most real. The problem with the magnetic beads. Uh, if you don't use the right ones, you get lots of non-specific binding or not good binding. So you don't want non-specific binding because then you'll pull the tumor cells out. We do those things by spiking known amount of tumor cells. We make sure that uh, it doesn't bind to our tumor cells. We have patient cell lines now, so they are real circulating tumor cells. So the, there are only a few companies who have uh, uh, beads that are reliable or work good. We are really pushing to go into nanobeads because the, although the cost per uh, volume will be the same, but you have zillions more uh, nanobeads. With the new magnetic circuit we have, that is a much better gradient. Uh, we, we, we haven't done it, but our calculations show that we can use nanobeads, uh, magnetic beads, to be able to do 10, 20 mil volumes not the large volume, because you're going fast, you, you won't get generate enough magnetic momentum with nanobeads. And, but we will, you know, that's the pain point for us because it's the big cost. We want to be able to reduce that down. If we could go to nanobeads, then it's going to be, you know, pennies to, as far as the add of uh, additional cost of the beads for isolation. So that's a very good question. This, Thank you. It was a very fascinating presentation. Uh, my question was that, do you have any real-time performance analytics in this device, like imaging technologies or stuff like that, where you can like keep account on how these uh, cells are getting fil filtered through the process? We have some sensors at the inlets and outlets, so when things clog, uh, we could uh, uh, figure that out. Also, the the magnets are in this metal block that, uh, that you put the chip in there, it fits exactly, and, and then when you close it, it pushes it in a way that it's lined up perfectly with the magnets. But we have open areas where you could visually see, and usually that's the portion of the uh, Formula 100, basically they're not red blood cells, so when you get clogging and whatnot, you can visually see it. But that's a good question. We haven't engineered more optics or other things to do autonomous type monitoring. Great. So I think we're going to have to close it off there. The sessions start in about half an hour. Between now and then, we have some fantastic exhibits in the lobby out here and around the corner. Go find out what these uh, really interesting companies are up to, see how they can help with your problems. And please join me in thanking Dr. Toner for an absolutely fascinating presentation.